Take your Bible and turn with me, if you will, to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Des mentioned that when he first came over here um, back in the 90s, it is true, we didn't know if he was going to go home or not. Uh, we offered our home for him as a base to, to stay in, and he took us up on it. Going to be there for a couple of months. One night, he had a bedroom there, and, and my wife, he's on the telephone talking to his wife, and my wife comes out, she says, I can hear him in the hall, and, and he says, he's talking to his wife, and she sold her house, and he doesn't know where she's at. Well, he's with us in America, and she's in South Africa, and she's sold her home and, and has disappeared. What's the chance of him going home? <laughs> so she was a little concerned about that, and, and I don't think she even yet understands exactly what went on. But it turned out it was okay, that it was circumstances that, that, that he, he did know where she was eventually. But we were certainly honored to have Des with us, and at Shorewood, we've always felt like Des was sort of a part of our assembly. He, he, he immediately became... Uh, acquainted with our guys. He was there about three days, and I, I was going on, on some meetings, and I went out to Ohio, and I said, well, you got to go with me. So we went to Ohio, and went to some Bible conferences, went up, wound up in Detroit to make tele the TV program, and we, we would make four programs every time we, that I was there. And so I told him, I said, I'm going to make three programs, then you can do the fourth one. So if you wanted to, if, if, you, if you had enough pull, you could get a copy of Brother Des when he was really young, physically and spiritually, and, uh, and, and he actually didn't make a TV program. He, we, we talked, we, I, I didn't invite him to do it, I just told him he was going <laughs> to, and he did. We went from there, he went, he went with me for meetings all over the country, went out to, we went out to uh, Canada, and Brother John Verstegen and, and uh, Brother Blades and, and so forth, and he got to meet John and get familiar with the saints out there, and we, we, go, we would fly to uh, a place in Washington and then drive across. Keith would come down and get us to drive across. And uh, coming back, he'd bring us back down there and uh, they wouldn't let Des back in the U.S. His paperwork wasn't right. And you, getting into Canada, they, they just said, well, come on in. But coming back in the U.S., the guy looks in, he says, where are you from? And each by each attendant came to Des and that sweet accent he has, he obviously wasn't an American. And so back then, they cared if you came across the border. And we spent about three hours with some of the sternest border crossing people, you know, and finally they let him in, but uh, he got it straightened out. But by the time he left, he went home. A couple of years later, they, he and his whole family came back. And his wife told me, she says, I wanted to come because I wanted to see these people that made such a difference in my husband. It wasn't us, it was the doctrine. But it was us and what Joe was talking about, the, not just the doctrine on a piece of paper, but the doctrine in some people. And the, the impact that, that the truth living in people ha, ha, has. And Des is a living example of that. You other, a lot of other folks here, Brother, brother uh, Joel preaching earlier. And that issue of, of not just knowing the truth, but having God's truth live in and through you. Back in my early days, uh, the Exchange Life Movement, they used to say, Ian Thomas, it's a Christ gave his life for you at Calvary so he could give his life to you when you trusted him so that he could live it through you day by day as you walk by faith in him. And that's, that's, that's the grace message. The dispensational truth gets you to that, and that's the living grace that God has for us today. Amen. And that's, that's what, for me, when I say the grace message, I'm talking about that. Not just how you get there. You can't get there without Paul. But when you get Paul and you don't get there, you didn't get what Paul's there for. So the whole, 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 and part of what you see here in this ministry is we've been doing this since the early 80s. Um, I, almost none of you, but Hal, <laughs> most of you aren't as old as Hal, been around that long. Some of you have. Fiasco, where's, where's John Manasco? Well, yeah, Corky's been there. A few of us, but it goes way back. So th this ministry didn't just come up last week. And what you see, in, and you'll see in this preaching, is the maturity level that comes from learning the doctrine, having it live in you, and you go through some, you know, tribulation works, patience, patience, experience. To me, that great tribulation works. <laughs> it produces stuff. And all growth requires suffering. And when you suffer, the suffering of this present time teach you to trust God's grace because nothing else works. And that's the life that we have in Christ Jesus.
And that, that's, that's the whole issue and, and the, the, the studies. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to warn you. Uh, was it Des said a moment ago, or somebody did, that uh, the topics, tomorrow night, my topic, and Sunday morning, my topic, were the topics I had last year. Now, I don't know why they gave Robert the topic. I don't know why they gave me the topics. But if you want to hear what I have to say about those topics, get the tapes from last year. Because I'm going to say something, I'm going to teach something else this time. And uh, I'm going to do that because, well, I've already done the other. And I could just stand up here and play those things, so I'm going to teach something else. Tomorrow night, I'm going to talk to you about something a little different. Why does the world hate, the world hate the Jew? Is war going on in Israel again now? Why is it that the, the upright, it just like the world takes the, the side of the anti Jew. There's a reason for that. If you, I, I listened to some people recently on, on my favorite TV pro, uh, channel is C-SPAN. And I listened to some guys on C-SPAN trying to explain economically and socially. There's one reason in the Bible. Talks about it. We'll talk about that tomorrow night and, and what the result of that is. If you've ever wondered what's going to happen to Islam, it's all explained by that. Then Sunday I want to talk to you about if you miss the rapture, what's going to happen then? Because the future after the rapture is very clear in the scripture. But what happens if you miss it you, and, and, and you didn't get it? So I'm going to talk about some of those kind of things tomorrow and the next day. Just, I'm just warning you, so if you don't want to be here, don't be here. But if you come expecting me to t teach what's in the, in the bulletin, I did that last year. And uh, if you want those things, well, then you could go sleep, sleep in tomorrow and get the tapes from last year, okay? All right, Psalm 116, 119, I'm sorry. I'm, suspe I'm susceptible to say the wrong thing quite often, so if you need to correct me, it's okay. My wife's here. She'll do it later, and you can do it now. I, I didn't. I, my hearing aid is not turned up enough. I can't hear her from here, so. Okay. Okay. Either way, what, whatever makes you happy. <laughs> Most people are happy to do the correcting. Psalm 119. Father, we thank you tonight for your word as we look into it now for a few minutes and just to try to glean some understanding out of it and to appreciate uh, the, the value uh, of, of your word to us in our lives and how you've designed it to be life for us. Designed it to be the instrument by whom, by which we can know you and commune with you and have your life be our life. We thank you for that. In Christ's name, amen. Psalm 119, verse number 162. The Apostle Paul says, uh, the Apostle David says, Psalm 119, 162. I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. Spoil is riches, things that are, that, 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 that are, that are over. I rejoice in thy word like I found something valuable, extremely valuable. Ver verse number 72, he puts it this way, The law of thy mouth is better unto, unto me than ten thousands of gold and silver. Verse 14, he says, I have, re I have rejoiced in, in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. Now, I don't know about you, but I, he, there, there was a thing on the Internet the other day uh, on Facebook where someone asked the question, do grace preachers get as excited about learning doctrine in the Bible as they do about winning a ball game? And they were talking about the, the, the college uh, games. I, my wife is a rabid Alabama fan. And I, I've often said and, and teased her about I'm down in the, in the basement and she's upstairs. I know how the game's going by how hard her feet are hitting the floor. And just because she, she loves, the, loves the game and she loves the team and she's enthusiastic about it. And these guys are hooting and hollering and carrying on about, about the preachers, about the ball game. Do you ever get that excited about the Bible? Do you, would, do you get as excited about understanding God's Word, getting life out of God's Word, as you would of winning the lottery? That's what the, David said. Learning, understanding, getting truth out of God's Word is more valuable to me than discovering a bunch of money. Getting rich. It's the most valuable, exciting thing. It's what I rejoice in above all things. Now, if you look down at verse number 130, 
If you're going to joy and rejoice in God's word, there's a reason that it becomes the joy of your heart. Verse 130, the entrance of thy words, notice words. There's the word, the whole thing, and the words, the details. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. You know what it's like to walk down a hall in darkness? You don't know what to do. Don't stump your toe. You don't run into things. At my age, I, I, I'm grateful for a wall. I walk down the hall and I hold on to the, just, just being able to touch the wall helps. But light, the interest of thy word, I understand what's going on. It gives understanding. It gives me the capacity to know what's going on. It giveth understanding to the simple. And that's us. God's word produces understanding in your life. It produces the ability to grasp what's going on. It's understanding that, 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 that brings light. Verse number 144. The righteousness of thy testimonies is everlasting. Give, give me understanding, and I'll what? Live. If you want life, it's going to come from understanding. And the understanding is going to come from God's Word. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, understanding what the will of the Lord is. When you understand what God's doing, that produces life. It produces the ability to live the life that God's given you in, in, in time for God's glory. Your intelligent understanding of what God's doing gives you the ability to relate to everything that's happening in your life. It gives you the ability to get over yourself and understand what God's doing and understand what the program that you're a part of, what God's doing. Now, nothing, if you're going to have understanding of God's Word, come with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Because this, this is where I'm going with all that. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 7. Paul says, Consider what I say. And what happens? The Lord give thee understanding in all things. So where are you going to get understanding? Whatever the deed, listen, what a, whatever the dark places in your life you're going through today, whatever the joys of life, whatever the challenges are, to have understanding about what the will of the Lord is in, in that circumstances, you're going to get it by considering what Paul says. We follow, Paul said, be you followers of me, even as I am of Christ. Verse 15 in that chapter, he says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. To get understanding in God's word, you have to rightly divide God's word, to get understanding in God's word, so that you can know what God's doing, so that, that what God's doing can live in your life, and be life for you. And it's not just to be a doctrine you believe, it's to be a life that you live that the doctrine produces. It's that faith obedience. Your faith resting in an intelligent understanding of what God's doing, who He's made you in Christ, and how that is your life. That's the reality of your current present identity as a member of the body of Christ. You're not Israel. You're not a lost sinner. You're a saint of the Most High God, a member of the body of Christ. And that means something in what God's understanding that gives your life purpose and meaning and allows God's life to live through you as you put your faith and trust in His Word, and you bring that into the details of your life. So understanding that. Now, all through the years, Friday night, in these Bible conferences, you go back into the 80s and the 90s, we always call this night the chart night. You guys remember that? And that was because what we did on the Friday, whatever the topic of a conference is, if you can understand it from the perspective of right division, you can always get to it. So we always use Friday night as a night when, this was the night when if you, you're talking to people, you're trying to share right division with them, you're trying, you bring them to the Bible conference on Friday night because we're going to draw the chart, go, go, go over the chart. So I thought, well, tonight what I would do, since they were repeating the topics, I'll just repeat the, I'll make this a chart night. I want to go over the chart with you. And I'm going to do it, not because I don't think you know it. There are some of you that are new and haven't been over with us personally. I asked the guys when we came in, how can we have a Grace Conference without a chalkboard? I'm not sure, but we're going to try. Okay, we got one on the we got one over there. But it the first time I, I, I just a personal thing, the first time I ever drew this chart, the, the right division chart, in a in a conference like this was in Orlando, back in the early either 1980 or 81, I don't remember which. I'd moved to Chicago in 1979, and there was a pastor down here in Naples, Florida, Art Sims, and Art had had come into right division. And we met at Cedar Lake in the conference up there, and we got to be good friends discussing 
kind of standing up for uh, oppose the Lordship salvation that was being taught up there at the time, and began to be friends. And there was a conference in Florida Thanksgiving weekend that started back in the 1960s. My home church is Forest Park Bible Church in Mobile, Brother Royal Lange. He was a part of it, and I knew about it both through the years. And, and back in, in, the, in the 60s and 70s, the, the snowbirds, folk the, in the Midwest, uh, Illinois and Michigan, that understood right division began to retire, and they began to move down here. There are several great churches uh, on, on the Atlantic coast that were, 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 were actually built by, by those brothers that came down and, and, and wanted to have assemblies and so forth. And so they would have a meeting at Thanksgiving. And one, when Art is down here, and he, um, he, he came into, into Right Division, and they got to know him. And what they would do every year is a different preacher would be in charge of the program. So they made Art in charge of the program that year. And he asked me, he said, would you come? And that kind of caused a little wrinkle because I was working at the Brain Bible Society with Mr. Stam, and a lot of those folks didn't like Mr. Stam, and he didn't like some of them for some other reasons. And so when I came, it, it took a little patience on their part to, you know, to be willing to be gracious. And they were, they were very kind. And, and, and let me come. And so the first night, they had a big chalkboard, you know, a big blackboard, and I drew the right division chart. Time passed about nine ages to come, and I talked, you know, about 90 miles an hour like I do now. I don't do that anymore. I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about half speed now. When you're 74, you don't have the, the vim, vigor, vitality, and spits you did when you were 34. So I'm, real, I'm realizing that. But um, anyway, I drew that chart, and I had never had the reaction that I had that night. They're, they're guys that have been preaching longer than I've been alive, and they go, wow. And for some reason, it was the first time some of them, brother, brother, you remember Brother Fleming? My brother Fleming died. He's about 102 years old, an African-American pastor down in southern Florida. Just a great old stalwart for the faith. He'd get on the Greyhound bus and drive all the way to Chicago to preach. And he said, now, if you've ever seen me do that thing in person on, on a chalkboard, when it's over with, you can't read it because I scribble all over it. He took pictures of it. And about three weeks later, sent me pictures. He'd gone to a sign painter and got a sign painter to make, make a chart, draw it, drew it out. And he sent me pictures of him in front of it teaching. And then a picture of him with his wife, Dorothy. And she's there. And he said, now, I gave her permission, but she's teaching. And I thought, wow, that... And I, it, it was the first time it, real, it dawned on me that this thing's going to be helpful for people. And I began to draw the thing and teach the thing. Of course, you, a lot of you guys have seen that. And one of the things that that did was it, it made me understand that understanding the whole picture is very important, not just a piece of it. This chart uh, came from originally John Verstegen's ministry in California, Brother Ted Maroff, if you know who Ted is, and Harold Stewartson. I went out there one time in the in the late 80s, and Harold had, and, and Ted had painted this chart on a, on a piece of plywood, made it with the, uh, with, with the, uh, the, the key to the, the way this design is that you can close it up and just hide, hide the mystery in the prophetic program. And the first time I ever taught this chart and did that, reveal the mystery, was in San Juan Capistrano in the late 80s, and it was like a hush went over the whole group. And I thought, wow, that's good. We don't have to make that in. And that's why we made the little fold-out chart. Well, the idea of the chart is simply to help you understand who you are. You're not Israel. You're the body of Christ. But most important thing is so you can understand God's Word. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, when Paul says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. It takes study to understand God's Word. Did you know if you read, if you read 28... If you read three chapters a day in Paul's epistles, you read his epistles through in 28 days. Imagine that. You could read all of Paul's epistles in less than a month. If you do that for six months, you know what you'll do? You'll start reading Paul's epistles through four or five times a year. I dare you. You can't just read three chapters a day for six months and not want to read six chapters a day and not want to read nine chapters a day and not want to over and over and over again. You know how I know? I do that. I'm 74 years old. I still read Paul's epistles through at least once a week. I'm, I, you know, you know, my wife, I guess she'll tell you, I, you say, why do you stay up so late at night? Well, I'm reading. I'm studying. What do you do all day? I'm reading. I'm studying. You said, uh, you, somebody asked you a while ago, about, I'm a playing golf. Well, I don't have time to play golf anymore because I'm not as agile as I used to be. But what do you do? I, 
it takes time to study. I study stuff now that I'll never be able to teach, but I'm, in, I'm teaching the book of Ezekiel. I figured something out the other night in Ezekiel 36 I've, stu I've struggled with for 30 years. And all of a sudden, there it is. And I think, man, I was an idiot not to see that. But you know how you see something like that? Because you've been studying, you've been studying, you've been studying. That's how you get it. It builds in you. Study. Why? To show yourself approved to God. I don't care if you like me or not. I'd like you to, I guess. Depending on who you are. <laughs> There's some people I just soon not hug my neck so much. But <laughs> none of you. But you need God's approval. His approval. You're already approved in Christ. But you want to do what you do. You want to measure up to who you are. Work when the needs not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, then how are we going to do that? Well, if Paul tells you to do it, my, my attitude has always been, if Paul tells me to do it, then I should ask Paul how to do it. I'm not going to ask Dr. Schofield. He's got good ideas. I'm not going to ask, ask Larkin how to do it. I'm not going to ask Bullinger how to do it. I'm not going to ask Mr. Stam how to do it. I'm not going to ask Pentecost or Pettingill or anything. Great scholar, Gable Line. I'm not going to ask any of those guys to do it. I'm going to ask Paul. I might consider what they say, but I'm interested in how Paul says to do it. There are two passages in Paul's epistles where he does just what he does. And by the way, when he says right to divide the word truth, that is dispensational Bible study. That's a Bible word. A lot of people say, well, you know, it's just handling God's word correctly. Don't get your hermit. If you look at verse number 16, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase. Anything that is not rightly dividing God's word is vain and profane babblings. It's vain babblings. Empty, worthless, do, do no good. And it's worse than that, it's profane you know what profanity is? That's what you, you're teaching something that isn't the Word of God rightly divided. You're just cussing. Profanity. You say, why do you say that, Brother Rick? Because I read the verse. I'm not trying to be unkind. I'm, I'm speaking the truth in love. But I'm speaking the truth. I'm not mad at you. I'm just telling you what it says. And their word will eat to death of canker. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth of error. Now, what did they do? Saying the resurrection doesn't exist. That's not what the verse said, is it? But you sat there like it was. When a preacher reads a verse and reads, doesn't read what it says, reads something else, what are you supposed to do? No, preacher! Wait a minute. Okay, now I'll misread something. Yell at me. But that, that's serious there. Saying that the resurrection is past. Not that it doesn't exist, but it's past. That means there's a timeline. Paul's here. They're saying the resurrection is back there. That is, on the timeline, they got it in the wrong place because the resurrection is still future. Well, that's all dispensational Bible study is, is you draw a timeline and you place things on the timeline where they belong. That's what rightly dividing the word of truth is in the context. Now come with me to Ephesians chapter 2. There are two passages in Paul's epistles where he, he lays out his understanding of how these things work out. One is Romans 5 and one is Ephesians 2. Romans is a book of foundational doctrine. And Ephesians is, is, is more advanced doctrine. And both of the passages where he does it are based on that kind of concept. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 11, Wherefore, remember that ye, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, by that which is called the uncircumcision, by that which is called the... I had cataract surgery two months ago, and I still have some of these little squiggly things that happen after you, you, know, you have your eyes worked on. And so my vision sometimes gives me a little problem, and it's doing that right now. So um, if, I, if I quote the verse instead of read it, that's why you think I misread it, okay? Because I talk kind of fast that way sometimes. Wherefore, remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision, in the flesh made by hands. When I read that verse, that word called is the verse that sticks out to me. Here's a bunch of people that are calling each other names. And you have two groups of people. You have the circumcision, and then you have the uncircumcision. And the circumcision called these people uncircumcision. The uncircumcision called these people circumcision. This is the Gentiles, and that's Israel. And there's, there's a separation between them. The separation's in verse number, number 12. That at that time, time passed, 
ye were without Christ. Now that's serious. So in time past, there's a serious situation to the Gentiles down here because they're without Christ. They're without a Savior. They're without a God. They're, they're out there with nothing spiritually. Why are they without Christ? being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise without hope and without God in the world. There's an advantage that God gave these people up here that these people down here don't have. So time passed in your Bible is anytime you're reading through, studying through, and, and you see this distinction that God makes between the circumcision and the uncircumcision, that's time past. Now verse number 13, things change. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometime were far from made nigh by the blood of Christ. So this time past thing comes along here, and then there's a point where the, the time past transitions into but now. And what happens is that, the, that through the fall of Israel, salvation goes to the Gentiles, and now there's a oneness in here. You go from time past to but now. But that's not going to last forever because verse number 7 says that in the ages to come, he might show forth the exceeding riches of his grace to us in Christ. So you have time past, but now, and the ages to come. That's what time is. So there's your timeline. So you need to see the distinctions. How, does, how do you know when you're in time past? How do you know when you're in the but now? And then when you're in the, and, and the ages to come, those two things are going to come to fruition. So go back with me, if you will, to time past. Come with me to Deuteronomy chapter number 32. You'll notice that it, it, it's always fascinating as you study your Bible. When you come to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, you've covered 2,000 years of human history, 12 cha 11 chapters. And you say, wow, that's, that's, uh, that's a lot. Then you start with Abraham, and you don't even get 400 years the rest of the book. And you get you got 2,000 years almost here from Adam to Abraham, and then from Abraham to Christ, you got another 2,000 years. Obviously, this part here is more interesting, and talk, God does a lot more talking about this than it does the first 2,000 years. Well, what's the deal? In Deuteronomy chapter 32, Moses reminds Israel, verse number 7, Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy fathers, thy father, and he shall show thee, thy elders, and they will tell thee. Israel has an understanding of what went on before them. That will pass it down. When the Most High, and I notice that title, divided to the nations, the Gentiles, their inheritance. When he separated the sons of Adam... He set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. So there was a time back here and time past back here where God separated away the Gentile nations. What happens in the first 11 chapters of your Bible is you, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, the earth was without form and void, and there's the, the gap, and God <laughs> replenishes the earth with man. man. He has a purpose for man to do what? Go out and take dominion over the earth. He gives man three institutions, volition, marriage, family, and go out and replenish the earth with it. So man goes out, but he doesn't do very well because Adam sins, you know that, and, and sinful man can't accomplish these things. So you come to the place in Genesis 6 where the whole earth is corrupt, and so you have the flood. And God's going to say, well, okay, we're going to reset things, start again. He takes Adam takes Noah, who's perfect in his generations, puts him on the boat, puts him across the, 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 the flood, and puts him out on new life ground, and in Genesis 9, gives him exactly the same commission he gave Adam. So you're going to start again. Only thing is, now he's going to add one more institution. Genesis 10 is called nationalism. In Genesis chapter 10, a nation is borders, language, and cultures. At the Tower of Babel, he separates. You remember Babel? And he separates the people. What does he do? He changes their language. He doesn't change their skin color. He doesn't change where they, wh what they like to eat. He changed their language. Because when you have different languages, you know, uh, we were in the hotel here last night, and the, the air conditioner isn't working in the room. So this morning, they send the repairman up to work on the air conditioner. And I'm talking to him, and he talks back to me, but I couldn't understand a word he said. Not one word. He understood something I said. I actually, are you going to get it finished? And he's, blah, 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 and so forth. And a little while later, they call and said, well, we can't fix it. You've got to move. Well, I didn't get that from the repairman. He was working on it, doing a good job, doing what he's doing. But his language, he's speaking Spanish. I didn't understand it, and he didn't, you know, makes a difference. 
So if you're going to have fun with people, enjoy people, relax with people, you want to sit down with you. So he divides the nations up in the language groups. They go to get different geographic areas because they gather together. Then he puts borders around them. So a nation is a border, language, and culture. It starts with language that puts people together. They, get cult they, they, they develop a culture. And a culture, often, most of the time, your culture is, is, is rooted in where you're geographically located. So you have borders, language, and cultures. In Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul says, God separated the nations, put the borders around them if happily they might seek after him. God's purpose was to isolate people together in, in, in groups that could understand one another so that they had a possibility of responding. But what he did in Genesis 11 is when they, the Tower of Babel, that's a religious issue. And in essence, they, 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 the, the nation said, we'd rather have the gods out here than the creator God. And God literally, in Romans 1, he says he gave them up. Uh, look at Romans chapter 1 real quick. There's a whole bunch of stuff going, on, going around right now about, uh, about hell and about uh, whether all, everybody's going to be saved and it's right to have a, have a God that puts people in hell and that kind of stuff. And, and you know, frankly, this idea that it's, the, it's Augustinian theology, uh, which is basically uh, paganism, and they say, well, it's the, the God of the torture chamber, the eternal torture chamber. You don't torture people when you punish them. Torture is when you unjustly inflict pain upon people. God never inflicts pain on anybody unjustly. He's the God of the all, all the earth. He does right. Chapter 2 of Romans, verse number, number 2, it says, uh, we're assured that the judgment of God is according to truth. It's not, God is not unjust in what he does. But you need to understand what it is, the punish, what it is, the wrath, what the wrath of God really is. The wrath of God is not just hell. The wrath of God is not just fire in the lake of fire. The wrath of God is not just torture. The wrath of God is something far more devastating than that. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. Now you read on down through that passage, you'll never read anything about hell. But you know what you read about? Verse 24, wherefore God also did what? Gave them up. You know what hell is? It's to be godless. You want to make hell out of your life? Don't have God in it. Verse 26, for this cause God gave them up. He did what he do? He gave them up to their own desires, their own the consequences of their own choices. Verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. He let them have what they chose to have. Matthew chapter 25, Jesus says, Depart from me, ye cursed. You know what the curse is? Depart. Be separated from God. That's the wrath of God. And you go down in Romans chapter 2, and you see how he talks about that. And, and, and describes... God's justice and God's judgment. Verse 2, 2-2. Two, two. And we're sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou, O man, that thou ju that judgest them that, that, that do such things, that thou and doest the same, that, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and the forbearance of his, of his long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? The wrath of God doesn't lead anybody to repentance. If it did, hell would be full of repentant people. It's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. Well, <clears throat> God, back there in Genesis, the pastor in Romans 1 is talking about this, He gave up those nations, let them walk in their own ways. He gave them over to the gods. And then He did something marvelous. He chose a man, Abraham. And he said, I, I'm going to take one man and I'm going to make a nation out of him and I'll show all these nations down here what it's like to have me as their God. They chose wrong. This is what it is to have me as their God. And he set Abraham up here in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse number 9. After he separates the nations, the, Lord, the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is a lot of his inheritance. God said, I'm going to take one, I'm going to take Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, I'm going to make a covenant and a promise with them. I'm going to make them my people in the earth. 
And when he takes Israel out of Egypt in Exodus chapter 19 and makes a nation out of them, he forms them with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He puts them into the, into the crucible of Egypt. And in Exodus 19, when he brings them out of Egypt, brings them across the, the desert, tests them, tries to train them as children. Exodus 19, verse 3, Moses said unto, unto God, went up unto God, I'm sorry, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus say, shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did in the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. I have taken you and separated you out from among the, the, the Egypt's the type of the world. I've separated you out, brought you unto myself. You saw me do that. They would go, go across the Red Sea. He takes them across the Red Sea, opens it, delivers them. Then he brings that judgment down on Pharaoh and all his, and he separates them, puts them on new life ground, and Israel becomes his nation. Now therefore, Verse 5, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, this is the greatest mistake Israel ever made. <laughs> Brother Langley used to call this the, the Bible's biggest if. If you'll keep my commandments, then, if then, that's the law. Everything you need to know about the law, it's performance-based acceptance. If you do this, then you get the blessing. What happens if you don't? There's a curse. But notice what it is. Then shall you become a peculiar treasure unto me. Now, when he says peculiar, that's one of those words you've got to be careful about, you know. That boy is a little peculiar. The word peculiar means doesn't mean strange and weird. We, we, it means to, to belong to. You'll be something especially identified with me. And you're going to be a treasure. Now, what what says above all the people of the earth. Now that's why I got the idea to draw this chart and put this Israel up here above all the people of the earth. One nation in the earth that he's going to have communion with. My nation. And the purpose of that nation is to demonstrate to all the other nations what it's like to have him as, as, as their God. So the whole purpose in creating the nation Israel was to be his testimony to all the other nations. Verse 6, And you should be unto me a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. Holy means to be set apart. You're going to be set apart, belonging to me, and you're going to be a kingdom of priests. You're going to be my ministers through whom the other nations can go. Can, you remember the Abrahamic covenant? I'm going to bless thee. Do, do, I didn't get any nods, yes. It helps when you know something. That, you know, we don't have to look at the verse. You, you, I got it in my mind. It, that helps. It helps because it facilitates the speed with which we can study. Okay, Genesis 12. Hang on to Exodus. When I first went to Chicago and began to preach at the North Shore Church, almost everybody in the church, about 60, 80 people left out of a church that at one time been 1,200. Jesse O'Hare had been their pastor for four, almost four decades, and he'd been gone for 20 years when I got there. And all the people, almost all the people that were there were, were his people. And I would, I'd, I'd start a verse, that ended. I'd say a reference, they'd quote it for me. It was the most exciting thing I, as a young preacher I ever said. I'd never had a gr group of people that, that, that could quote the verse faster than I could get to it. And I said, man, this is fun. This is wonderful. So get on with it. <laughs> Genesis chapter 12, verse number 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy, kindred, thy country and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make thee a great nation. And I will bless them that bless, that, and I'll, I'll bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them, that, and bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. The purpose of the Abrahamic covenant was not just to make a nation, not just to give them a land, but to be a, make a vessel through whom all the other nations of the earth could be blessed. These nations down here had been cut off. They'd gone their own way. Now God puts a testimony of the earth where, whereby these nations can be blessed. They can come to him, have his word, and know him as the true and living God. 
So now he has this kingdom of priests. So the whole purpose in the nation of Israel has to do with a kingdom over here at the end. And it has to do with a land, a literal, physical, visible, earthly kingdom with a piece of real estate that it's going to gov- uh, uh, operate over and a government that's going to be in there, a kingdom. In your Bible, the kingdom program focuses on God's purpose and plan with the nation of Israel. So when we talk about the kingdom program, that's what we're dealing with back here in time past. And it has to do with a literal, physical, visible nation ruling over a literal, physical, visible land, having a piece of land and real estate. Listen, God, there, God has a purpose and a plan. Israel has a future in the plan of God in the earth. Amen. That's called premillennial Bible study. Dispensational premillennialism is, a, is, is the, the approach to study God's Word. And by the way, I've said this for years, if you're a, a, a premillennial dispensationalist, that is as much a political statement as it is a theological statement. Because you're saying that the government of this world is not going to be fixed until Jesus Christ comes back and sets it up. You're not going to fix it. Your government's not going to fix it. Our government's not going to fix it. That government's, that's, his government's going to heal, dismantle the, the corrupt structures of, of, of government in the earth, and he'll establish a righteous government. And it will be a kingdom. It will not be a democracy. It will not be a, a, a whatever you want to say it, but it's going to be a kingdom with a righteous king and a government that he establishes that reflects his righteousness and his rule. Now, I know we're Americans, and we're proud of our country. Everybody, every country I've ever been in, the people are proud of their country. I've been in a, probably a dozen different countries. You know what they, what they always ask you? What do you think of our country? God made, you to, made people to love their, their nation, their country. It's natural. And we have, our, our nation has, is built structurally, uh, frankly, philosophically and structurally, as the fruit of the, of, of the Renaissance and the Great Awakening and the Protestant Reformation and the underpinning, the quasi-Christian value systems and so forth. But the structure, listen, it's not a, some of the, our founding fathers are some of the greatest atheists ever lived. You ever read, you ever read Tom Paine's Age of Reason? He's one of the founding fathers. He's the Christopher Hitchens of his day. They're not all Bible, believe, in fact, none of them are Bible-believing Christians. A lot, of, a lot of kind of crazy Christians. The kingdom, the government, that's going to be righteous. Now, by the way, do the best you can where you are. I'm not saying don't do that. Be light in the world that you're in. But don't look to the government to be the answer. That's what's going to happen. He's going to bring it about. Now, his purpose in Israel is to establish a nation to be that. That in your Bible is called prophecy. Come with me to Isaiah chapter 64. That's the plan of prophecy in your Bible. Make it Isaiah 61, I'm sorry. Isaiah 61, verse 1, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach the gospel, uh, good tidings unto the meek. This is a passage Jesus Christ quotes in Luke chapter number 4. So turn your Bible over to Luke chapter 4, and let's compare the passages. Luke chapter 4, and Isaiah chapter 61. The first time the Lord Jesus Christ went out to preach in his earthly ministry, Luke 4, verse number 16, he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, that's Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel. Now that's the passage we're reading in Isaiah chapter 61. You see that. Verse 19. And to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, verse 20, and he closed the book. And he gave it to the, to the, to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the, in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, now watch, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. So what Isaiah 61 is talking about is the first coming of Christ. So we're looking at the future. Isaiah's looking into the future, and he's looking at here's, his, here's the coming of the Messiah. Now notice in verse number 21, verse, I'm sorry, verse number 19, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, and he closed the book. Now go back to Isaiah 61, verse 2, and notice what he did, because what he did is quite startling. Isaiah 61, verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and he closed the book. 
But what does Isaiah do? Comma, and there's more. So he, he stopped reading in the middle of verse 2 in Isaiah 61. Now why did he do that? Well, look at the rest of it. And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all the that, that, that mourn. That's the second advent. That's the day of his wrath. So Christ says, look, the first coming is here, but the wrath hadn't come yet. So he stopped, because if you keep reading the verse, it, he couldn't have said, this day is that fulfilled in your ears. So what, he, what you've got in Isaiah 61 is here's Christ saying, here's my coming. The wrath isn't yet, but it's coming. He told, he told the people in Matthew chapter 3, the Pharisees, he says, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So he's talking about that tribulation. He's talking about the, the wrath to come, the prophesied wrath that we call the tribulation, seventh week of Daniel and so forth. It just hadn't come yet. So in Isaiah 61, by the way, Christ, he's rightly dividing the verse right down at the comma because everything between here and there is, is in that parenthesis between there. But my point to you right now is that Isaiah 61 is talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. This day says fulfill. The wrath hadn't come yet. Now go down with me in chapter Isaiah 61 because notice what comes after the wrath. To appoint unto, verse 3, to, unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, and oil for, uh, the oil of joy for mount mourning, and the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might uh, be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that, that he might be glorified. Verse number, run down to verse 6. But ye shall be named the priest of the Lord. So what's Israel going to be called out there after the wrath? The priest of the Lord. Why? Because he designed them, created them for the purpose of being a kingdom of priests. Ye shall be called, named the, uh, the, the priest of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Ye shall eat of the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall you boast yourselves. So Israel is destined in prophecy to be this kingdom of priests out here who represent and minister God's word to the nations. Okay? That's the goal of prophecy. That's where prophecy, the prophetic program, is designed to function. So when you come to the book of Matthew, and you see the, John the Baptist preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, there's nobody that, 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 that John the Baptist is preaching to that doesn't understand what's being talked about. They're talking about the time when the nation Israel can be that kingdom of priests, that holy nation that God designed them to be. In Matthew chapter 3, when John the Baptist preaches that, verse 2, saying, Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Verse number 5, Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized from them in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when the Pharisees saw many, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said to them, O generation of vipers, now that's a snake, that's the devil, a generation is where you came from. These are Satan's counterfeits who've taken over control of the nation Israel, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. So John is telling them that wrath is coming, you need to flee from it. How do you do it? You believe that the king, you believe the gospel of the kingdom, the repent, be baptized for the remission of sins. Verse number 11, I indeed baptize you with water and repentance, but he cometh, that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. He's going to baptize some folks with the Holy Spirit and with fire, whose stand is in his hand. He will thoroughly purge the floor. He's going to get out and gather the wheat into the garner. He's going to eliminate the unbelievers in Israel and gather the believers into the kingdom and establish them. Now that in the Bible is called prophecy. That's the program of prophecy in the Bible. And when the Lord Jesus Christ and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John come over with me to chapter 4, his ministry in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is about that. You've got Matthew 4 in one hand and Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, verse number 8. 
Now I said that Jesus Christ was the minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Jesus Christ is the minister of the circumcision. That's this crowd up here. For the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. That's these people back here. Then he quotes them, the next two verses. And they all have to do with making Israel the nation who's going to be the light to the Gentiles, his nation. So Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry was a minister of the circumcision to confirm the promises made. That's, that's the prophetic program. Now if you go back to Matthew chapter, five, chapter 4, you'll see it. Matthew 4, verse number... Uh, 12. Now when Jesus, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. Verse number 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's exactly what John the Baptist had been preaching. Verse 23. Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And watch. And healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout Syria. And they brought unto him uh, all sick people that, that were taken with diverse diseases and torments. And those that had, were possessed with devils. And those that were lunatic. And those that were, uh, had the palsy. And he healed them. Healed them all. That they brought. Two things. He's healing people and he's casting out devils. Those two signs. You remember in Exodus chapter 4 when God told Moses, I'm going to use you to deliver. He says, I, I can't do it. I can't. The Lord says, I'll give you two signs. One, put your hand in your bosom. Pull it out. It's leprous. It's put it in. Pull it out. It's healed. Healing. Take your rod. Cast it down. It's a, it's a snake. Pick it up. He can pick up demons. Cast out demons. Healing. Those two signs. Power over the physical effects of sin and the power of Satan. He's going to deliver creation from all that, from the dominion of, of sin and the dominion of Satan. Those signs were pictures of what was going to happen when Christ comes. The deliverance, the preaching of the kingdom. Chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10. He gives a sermon on the mount. He comes down off the mountain, begins to preach. Chapter 10, he gets his 12 apostles, 12 disciples. And when he called unto him the 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the name of the twelve apostles are these. This is the point where he ordains them. They're no longer disciples, now they're apostles. He gives you their names. Verse number five. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go into all the world and preach the gospel of grace. They, they, at least you listen. Go into all the world and preach. No. Go not into the way of the Gentiles. And into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you preach, as you go preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I've read that, that verse on the radio and the television all of this nation. You get people call, people write, people talk. You can make, you'll make somebody mad. Just show them that verse. Everybody says, just going to follow Jesus, the loving Savior. You know, he's going around doing good, like he's a goodwill guy. Read them that verse, and they choke on it. What do you do with it? You know what you do with it? You believe it. And you understand why it says what it says and where it is and where it is in the program of God. And it isn't you, because he couldn't, he couldn't come here and preach to you tonight if they were Bible-believing followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because what they're preaching is that program of the kingdom that it's going to be through the nation Israel that salvation goes. He's, it has nothing to do with it. He doesn't love Gentiles. Over and over and over and over, you see him love Gentiles. You see him longing. In chapter 13, after Israel has rejected him as a priest and, and, the, you know, and, and his prophet, priest, and king status in chapter 11 and 12, he, you see him, he goes out and he sits by the sea and looks out, longing, and gives the mystery prayers of the kingdom. Because it's going to be Israel that he has to redeem to get to do that. The Lord, hadn't, he had no shortcoming of love for the Gentiles. But his love for the Gentiles was through the plan that God had to reach them through the nation Israel. That's why when that little woman in Genesis 15, she comes and 
I think it's funny because as a pastor, I know how this works. Matthew 15. She, Matthew 15. What did I say? Leviticus? Genesis. Genesis. All right, well, back to the beginning. We'll never get through it. Go back to Genesis. Matthew 15, verse 21. Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Behold, a woman of Canaan came. Mark says she's a Syrophoenician, a Phoenician from Syria, Syria descent, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed for the devil. And he answered her not a word. He ignored her, wouldn't talk to her. Now, that's not very friendly. That's not the meek and mild little Jesus. So she goes to his disciples and say, Help! So his disciples came to him and said, Lord, send her away. She cries after us. Would you do something for that woman? She won't leave us alone. And he answered and said, I'm not sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now that's not being cold hearted. That's what God's program was. Then came she and worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, it is not me to not right, it's not qualified to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. Now you know what you call a female dog. That's as close as my wife will let me come to cussing, but there it is. I mean, just spit it out. You'll never get a modern translation that quotes that verse in modern English. You don't need to, you got it. In Mark, he says it this way. He says, let the children first be filled. Right. Israel's got to get it first, and then it'll come to you. And she said, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs that fall from the master's table. She said, I understand the program, Lord. I'm, just I'm willing to get under the They just won't drop any crumbs. I'm willing to get under the table. And he says, you know, I've not seen that kind of faith in Israel. I've not seen anybody in Israel that understands a program like that little Gentile woman did. Amen. But that was the program. Now, you go all through Israel through the ministry, and it's that way. People say, well, after the cross, it all changed. Well, come to Acts chapter 2 and notice that it changed in a strange way. Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit comes on the, on the twelve. Peter standing up filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in the Spirit, gave him utterance. Acts 2, verse 14. Peter standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be it known unto you. So who's he going to talk to? Everybody there dwelling in Jerusalem, and they were from all the nations. If you go back to verse number uh, 5, they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jew, Jerusalem, Jews, devout men, out of every nation from under heaven. And he lists them for you. So all these Jews had gathered there for Pentecost, he said, I want to say something to you. Then he says in verse number 22, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Then verse 36, he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know. Listen, if a Gentile was listening to Peter, he would have known he wasn't talking to him. He's filled with the Spirit speaking as the Spirit gave him utterance, and he talked just to Israel in the crowd. Specifically identifies them. That's not the way that passage is preached, but it's what it says. You say, well, why would he do that? Well, look over at chapter 3, verse 18, and I'm, I'm just going to move through this because you, you want to get to bed before midnight. Acts 3, verse 18. The next day, Peter's at the temple. He's speaking to Israel. But those things which God before hath showed by the mouth of his, whole, his prophets that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. You know, when Jesus hung on the cross and says, it's finished, we attribute a lot of things to what was finished. But in the context, the verse right before there, that it says, in order that this verse might be fulfilled, and he said, I thirst. So that a verse back in Isaiah 69 that hadn't been fulfilled yet was fulfilled. He's hanging on that cross, and all the scriptures are going through his mind. And there's one that hadn't been fulfilled yet. He speaks, and it's fulfilled. And then he says, it's finished. Everything God's word that God had planned and purposed to take place had taken place. 
It's all been fulfilled, Peter says. The, he's gone back to heaven. The Spirit's come. Joel chapter 2 has been fulfilled, beginning to be fulfilled. Repent you, therefore, and be converted, that your sins might be blotted out. Now watch carefully. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, when are they going to have their sins blotted out? When Christ comes back. It's called the Day of Atonement. The sins of the nation, and we're talking about individuals, we're talking about the nation. The Day of Atonement. He says, Repent and be converted that your sins might be blotted out when it comes to cleanse you from all your filthiness, Ezekiel says. Keep reading. And he shall send Jesus which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which are spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. That's prophecy. Prophecy is what God has been speaking by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. That's that program. Now, to make it short, time, make time short, let me show you a different program. Look with me at Romans chapter 16. It's fascinating, by the way, how that all of this is in the book of Romans, which is the first book you're supposed to read in Paul's epistles. Your edification program in the book of Romans takes you through all of this. Romans 16, verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you. And by the way, that's what you want. You want, to have, you want to have spiritual maturity in your life. You don't want to be tossed to and fro cared about everyone in doctrine. Here's the power, here's God, here's the methodology where God will bring, bring godly edifying, edifying into your life so that you can stand being strengthened in, by his spirit in your inner man. Now the hymns of power to establish you. If you go back to chapter 1, verse 11, Paul says, I, I want to impart some gift to you that you might be established. That is, that you might have the mutual faith both of me and you. To be established for a believer, chapter 1, verse 11 and 12 says, is to believe the same thing Paul believes. Understand what Paul says and have that fixed in your understanding. According to my gospel, now watch, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation, the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. There's a program in your Bible that was prophesied since the world began. There's a program in your Bible that was kept secret since the world began, but now is manifest. Something that was prophesied since the world began and something that kept secret since the world began Words, if words mean anything, they're different. They're not the same. There's a prophesied program and a unprophesied program, now revealed. Pre-planned, wasn't an afterthought, planned before the foundation of the world, but now, just kept secret till now. Now, come back with me in chapter 11 and notice what that means. The mechanics of it. Chapter 11, Romans 11, verse 11. Someone asked me a question earlier tonight about Romans chapter 10. Romans 9, 10, and 11 is part of the edification process in the book of Romans. These, these are chapters written to the body of Christ about Israel. They're for your understanding, uh, your edification and understanding about what happened to Israel in the change in program, what their current status is, and the fact that God is not through with them, but he will finish what he told them. Chapter 9, chapter 11, verse number 11. I say, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather, through their fall. So they stumble but don't fall, but then they do fall. So how does that work? They stumble at the cross. Here's the stumbling stone in Zion. Chapter 9, last verse in chapter 9. They stumble here, but they don't fall. They have a renewed opportunity. But then there comes a point when they do fall. Be stoning of Stephen's in Acts chapter 7. And through the fall of Israel, salvation goes to the Gentiles. Why? To provoke Israel to jealousy. There's a transition period in here where God carries on Paul's Gentile ministry in a special way so as to seek to provoke some of these lost Jews to get, because the body of Christ is made up of what? 
Jew and Gentile, lost Jew and lost Gentile in one body. So you've got to get some of those lost Jews saved. So Paul conducts, if you read verse 12, now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. So they fall and then they diminish away, become less and less an issue. Through, that's why there's a transition between Acts 7 and Acts 28. How much more their, their riches, they're going to be restored and it's going to be rich for everybody. Now watch verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, <clears throat> I magnify my office, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and save some. Paul said, I'm carrying on my Gentile apostleship in a way as to provoke some of those lost Jews to see, hey, God's left you and come over here. In Acts chapter 18, Paul goes into, into the synagogue in, in, in Corinth and preaches, and this one of the three places he says, I'm turning to the Gentiles. And he leaves and goes right next door. The church at Corinth, is, the verse says, is join hard. That means it's got one common wall. It's like a storefront with one. There's the synagogue and there's the church. And they're over here. Have you ever wondered why the church at, synagogue, at Corinth has all the tongues and all the gifts and stuff going, obviously breaking out everywhere? They belong to Israel. There's signs of Israel's God demonstrating. But where's Israel God? He's over there with the Gentiles. It's a testimony that Israel's God has left them and gone to the Gentiles. That synagogue got a pastor, a guy named Crispus. You know what happened to him? He winds up over here. They call another pastor, Sosthenes. You know what happens to him? He's over here too. It's working. That's why that stuff's going on like it is. Paul's conducting his, his Gentile apostleship in a way as to provoke those Jews to get saved. Now that's a temporary thing, but that's, he's doing it. Because that's you form the body of Christ out of Jew and Gentile, bond and free male and free male. Verse 15, for the casting away them be the reconciling of the world, which shall deceive them at life from the dead. This program is going to last forever. It's going to be over one day. And when it is, God's going to go back and finish his program with Israel. That's the cardinal mistake that non-dispensationalists make. They think God replaced the Israel with us, and he didn't. How could you replace, how could you make us Israel? I mean, the body of Christ Israel. When in the body of Christ, there's neither Jew or Gentile. I sat at a table just recently, Alex and I did, with some radio executives, and they're talking to us. We're on the radio six days a week in Chicago, and that's, uh, that, they come and, court you every now and then offering you some more time and we're sitting there talking and the guy says you know you, you you really teach different on the radio than most of these guys do and I, I'm waiting for him to say that and I said yeah yeah let's talk about that about a minute and so we we talk about it a little bit and I said you know you guys believe that uh, that the church today is Israel replacement Israel yes I said, well, tell me something if the body of Christ, Paul says, neither Jew or Gentile bond, how can, he, how can he put you into a spiritual body of believer where there's no Jew and make you a Jew? How can you be spiritual Israel in a body of group where there's no Israel? You know what? There's no answer to that. Oh, there is an answer. You can't. But you can't say that and maintain your religious tradition. Anyway. Verse number 25, Romans 11, Now, I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. There are six or seven times Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. I've called that for years the world's largest denomination. <laughs> you can drive up in the average church next Sunday. Drive up in, unscrew your head, put it in the glove compartment, lock it up, you're going to need it when you go home, you won't need it in church. You can get all kind of music, you can get all kind of entertainment, you can get all kind of Tony Robbins kind of promotional you know, uh, messages to, to hype you up. Preacher will give you three points in a poem and quote a verse. But you're not going to need, you're not gonna need your brain in there. Right. Ignorance is the mark of modern Christianity. Has been historically. But I don't want you to be ignorant. By the way, you ought to study the seven things he says don't be ignorant about. Specific things until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. When the salvation, when Israel's, when the Gentile program's over, what's going to happen? And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written. He's going to go back from this 
unprophesied, unexpected interruption to the pro prophecy program. And prophecy is going to be fulfilled. God isn't through with Israel. He'll keep every, everything he ever promised him, keep everything he ever said. But right now, that's not what he's doing. And the glory of his grace is to know what God is doing. The f to, to, to know how you can know your creator. You can fellowship with him in life. Come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, chapter 2. You can have his mind. Look at the details of my life. Look at the things that I'm going through and things I'm experiencing, things my family experiencing, my, and I can think about them the way God thinks about them because I have his mind, because I understand his word. One of the most exciting verses to me about all this is this 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. See how God defines the words for you? When he says mystery, he's not talking about some mystery, like a Christy thing. He's not talking one of the mysteries of the faith of some you know, Hindu yoga kind of stuff. It's hidden, something, it's secret, which God ordained before the world. That program didn't start as an afterthought over here. It started before the foundation of the world. God had a plan. He had an ingenious plan. <laughs> which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If Satan had known what God was going to do through the cross work of Jesus Christ, what's he going to do? He's going to redeem a nation in the earth to establish his authority here then he's going to do something that's absolutely inexplicable. You remember in Isaiah 14 when Satan talks about what he's going to do, he said, I'm going to be like the Most High. You remember that verse a minute ago about Most High? I told you, remember? That title, Most High, in your Bible is defined in Genesis chapter number 14 when Abraham meets Melchizedek. He's a priest to the Most High God, comma, possessor of heaven and earth. The title Most High describes God, the Creator, as the authority, the ruler in the government of the heaven and the government of the earth. Now, you know he has a government in both because in Colossians 1.16, Paul says that Jesus Christ created all things that are in heaven and earth, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers. Those are governments. He didn't just create the stars and the nebula and the trees and, and, and the oceans. He created a government to rule all of that. All things were created by him and for him. He created that government to run the universe for him. Execute his will. Carry out his purpose. Demonstrate the... In that text in Colossians, it says, and the Father finds all preeminence in his Son. God the Father. This whole reason of creation. God the Father looks at God the Son. By the way, the Trinity is an idea that people just can't get over. I've never understood that. One God, three persons. Look here. There's all kind of people here tonight, and you're all human. You're equally human. Now, you might not think you are, but you are. Nobody's one more human than the other. We all look different, kinds of, but we're all human. But look how many distinct people there are. In the Godhead, there's, there's God, like our humanity, shared by three people. There are only three people who share all of the essence of, the, of, of Godhead because there are only three people in, that share, just like we all share humanity, they share deity. But they're distinct. And God the Father, God the Son, God, they've known each other forever because they've always been there. And God the Father loves his, each member of the Godhead lives for the glory of the other member of the Godhead. No member of the Godhead lives for themselves. And you've got three so that you've got a testimony. <laughs> if Brother Tom here says, he does some, something, and his wife says, well, I've been around him long enough, and I've, I've noticed him do something else. She can testify he did or he didn't. And you've got a third person who so I've known both of them, they can trust what they say. So you've got testimony. And God the Father looks at his son, 
And he says, everything centers in him. The one that has the preeminence in God the Father believes that if you could see in his son what you see in his son, you'd love him like he does. Read John 17 where Jesus says, Father, I'm longing to go back into the glory we had before, the, before everything was created. Just us, the communion, with, the life we had. And the life was the Father delighted in his son, valued his son, and wanted to share the privilege of knowing his son with, with a creation. Imagine you've got the privilege of sharing the life that the Father values above everything else in you. Glory! <laughs> How in the world can you just sit there and say, oh, that's okay, I think it's fine. I just think I'll go out tomorrow and do what I want to do. That's something that's so precious, so valuable. And God had a plan to put it in Christ. And Satan said, I want, I want that. I want the position. I want to be the mo I want to take possession of everything and of our whole sinner in me. You know what the middle letter of the word sin is? What's the middle letter of the word pride? You know what the middle letter of the word Lucifer is? You got an eye problem? He did. Five times he had an eye problem. You know what the middle letter of the word believe is? That's how you make a difference believe what God said, not what he said. Okay? I forgot where I was. I was having fun. I get, I, I, honestly, this is what all this, this is designed to get you to, is valuing and appreciating who your Savior is. Because that's the whole purpose that the Father had in creating everything. And Jesus Christ creates the heaven and the earth and the earth is, is, without, is, is, is void, darkness, the absence of God. Genesis 1, 2 is judgment. In God, in God is light and there's no darkness in him at all. He didn't create a creation to be absent from him. He created to be in it. But you see his absence. And then you see him come back. And he starts with the earth. The earth was without the earth. From Genesis 1, 2 all the way the Apostle Paul to focus on the earth. You come to Paul, you find out God didn't just have a plan to restore his authority in the earth. He's got a plan to exalt his son in the government of the heavens. And you say, wow. Satan, didn't, Satan fought this one thinking that was where the real battle was. When God says the real battle is the whole thing. Had Satan known what God was going to do through the cross work of Christ, he'd have never been taken. Corinthians, the letter part of that chapter, chapter 3, quotes Proverbs. He took the wise in his own craftiness. Ezekiel 28, they say about Satan, about, about him, say, he's, he's so wise, you keep no secret from him. God said, you want to bet? See, the issue has never been who's the most powerful. You know, you step out on nothing, create a universe, you, you're the big dog on the block, power-wise. But it's the wisdom to use that power for the good of others. Satan didn't have it. You want to see the glory of God's grace? You see it in what God's done through, through you, for you. At Calvary, by keeping to himself that, that wisdom until it came time to, to reveal it, can you understand why Satan doesn't want that spread abroad? Can you understand why your flesh doesn't like that? The glory of God's grace is to give you the privilege to enjoy the same relationship with his son that the father does. And you do that through the Holy Spirit who glorifies his son. That's why it's valuable. That's why it becomes life. And that's how it becomes life. Don't let it just be some things on the page. Don't let it just be a doctrine. Don't let it just be something that, what would you say, the guy about seven things th th threw his buddy over the river, over, over the... Don't let it just be, let it be life. And let it be the joy of life. And let, it, it comes from that understanding his word that produces that life in your life. Okay? All right, we've got a great day tomorrow. It's almost time to go to bed anyway. You're an hour ahead of me, so I'm, I'm, it's only 8.30 my time. I'm not even worried. And I'm not, I, don't have to I don't have to shovel snow tonight. 
If I was home, I would, and all the rest of it. So, uh, praise the Lord. If, you, if you're here tonight, and you, I, I'm not, I don't want to tack this on the end because I don't like tacking stuff on the end. But let me tell you, all that we've been talking about tonight as believers rejoicing in the riches of God's grace to us in Christ, there was years I'd have sat in a meeting just like this and been lost on my way to hell. No understanding about it. Because I thought it was what I did that made God happy with me. Until I realized that there was nothing I could do that I could undo. But it was what Jesus Christ did for me that God accepted. And I trusted him. And I passed from death to life because of that. And I sat just like you are. I didn't go anywhere. I didn't do anything. But down in my heart, my understanding, talking to the Lord, I said, I'm going to trust your son. Singing that song I, in my mind, I was raised a Methodist and I was playing the organ. Practicing, I played the organ for the youth choir. And I, I'd played a little mood music before the service. And I was practicing, I, I, I was singing, just as I am, that song, just as I am, without one plea. When you play music, you don't, you don't read the words, you play the music. I started reading, I said, that's that song the Baptist sang. <laughs> just as I am without one plea. But, I said, that's like a Baptist. I'm not going to make a plea, but I'll make one. <laughs> just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. And now they're going to make two. Poor guy says he's got none, has made two pleas. He, this guy's writing this song nuts. And that thy blood was shed for me. And that thy, I said, oh, wait a minute. I'm wrong. He said, just as I am without any other plea, except that your blood was shed and you asked me to come. And it's like light shining through the darkness. And I realized for the first time it was only what he did. If you never had that revelation in your heart, have it right now. Just trust him. You'll see God will save you. For those of you that are saved, I got up from there and determined I was going to go serve the Lord, do things that pleased him and honored him with my life. And you know what I found out? Your brother Cook, he asked me one day, he said, Brother Ricky, are you finding it difficult to serve the Lord? I said, you know, Brother Cook, I am. He said, Ricky, it's not difficult, it's impossible. You can't do it. Only he can live his life in you. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. You're not I, but Christ lives in me. The life that I allow to live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And it was another, bang! Because now as a believer, he didn't put me and said, now you go please me. I realized that his son had did everything. Everything that would please him, his son did. I continued to live in the identity God, the riches God gave me. There are some of you who struggle with your Christian life to please God. He'll never be pleased, more pleased with you than who you are in Christ. So just relax. You fumble the ball, thank God for his grace. Get up and don't fumble next time. The Alabama ball game the other night when they lost in the championship, the last play in overtime was a play they'd run over and over and over again. It was their two-point play. They knew how to make that three yards. They knew exactly how to do it. They knew how to, they didn't care if Michigan knew that they played. They knew how to do it in spite of the other team knowing. And one thing happened. The, the snap, the guy, he fumbled it. The hiker didn't hike the ball correctly. And the quarterback had to take his eye off the field look at the, to get the ball, keep him fumbling it. And it, that, that second, and that, that made the, the play kick the play into a loss. You fumble the ball sometime, don't you? God wasn't expecting you to keep it perfect to start with. You see, when you fumble the ball, you know what you do? I listen to the, to the quarterback and his hiker after the thing talk about it. And the quarterback says, he's been my hiker all year. We know all this stuff. He, he wasn't blaming the guy at all. And the kid said, you know what? I learned something from that. And what the coach talked to him is everything you do, when you do something wrong, look at it, find out what you did wrong, and fix it. Don't do it again. That's good advice. So when you fumble the ball, 
Don't go say, oh, I've disappointed God. I'm not pleased. He said, wait a minute. I need to go find out what I did wrong so I don't do it next time. And you grow. But you're not growing in order to make God happy with you because he can't be any happier with you than he is in Christ. You say, well, why don't I just go and do the thing I want to do? Well, go ahead and try that. See how that does for you. You know what you'll do? You'll learn that wasn't the place of source. That's not the source of peace and joy either. My point to you is relax and be who we are in Christ. That's the glory of God's grace. Think like the Father thinks about you. Father, we thank you tonight for the privilege we have of just being able to say that we we love you because you first loved us. In Christ's name, amen. All right, we'll see you.